let's get a few facts first. Late April 1959, Kawas Manikshaw Nanavati fires three shots from his service revolver. He kills the supposed lover of his wife. And then the special jury in the Sessions Court in Greater Bombay decides that Nanavati was not guilty by a majority of 8 to 1. That is Rohin Bhatt. He's a human rights lawyer who practices before the Supreme Court of India. He's also a bioethicist, which means that he is often thinking about how different decisions, whether in medicine or law, affect people, affect society, affect us. I called him to help me with a thought experiment, which is, could we ever have jury trials in India again, where a group of lay people help the judge decide if someone is guilty or not. After all, we regularly see jury trials play out in American courtrooms. You've had the law read to you and interpreted as it applies in this case. It's now your duty to sit down and try and separate the facts from the fancy. So why not in India? This episode is an Imagined Tomorrow short. And I'm your host, Shreya. Last time, we wondered, what if we had advanced tech like artificial intelligence in our courts? This episode, we are going the other way and exploring what it might be like to bring in more people into our courtrooms. We will talk about jury trials. What did these jury trials look like in the past? And can we imagine them back again? I think Dhanavati is kind of important in that it is the final nail in the coffin of jury trials in India. Naval Commander Kavas Nanavati, whose case has inspired several Bollywood movies. On a sunny summer day on 27th of April 1959 in Mumbai, Nanavati is having lunch with his wife Sylvia. At some point, Sylvia supposedly confesses to having an affair with Premahuja, their rich Sindhi businessman friend. This makes Nanavati so angry that he goes to his ship and takes out a semi-automatic revolver and six cartridges from its storage on a false pretext. Then he drives his car to 34-year-old Prem Ahuja's flat, rings the bell and waits to be let in by Ahuja's help. Then he walks straight into the bedroom where Ahuja stands with a towel wrapped around his waist. The prosecutor's version is that Nanavati pulls out his revolver and shoots Ahuja dead. The defendant's story is a bit more colourful, where apparently Nanavati first asks Ahuja this. Does he intend to marry Sylvia and look after their three children? Ahuja supposedly replies, Am I to marry every woman I sleep with? A scuffle follows and shots supposedly go off accidentally. Ahuja falls dead with the towel still wrapped around his waist. Nanavati then drives his car to the police station and surrenders himself. What follows next is a highly dramatic jury trial in a Bombay Sessions court in front of a judge and a panel of nine jury members. In the end, the jury returns a verdict of not guilty by an overwhelming majority of 8 to 1. But the Sessions court judge is not happy with this decision. The trial judge in the court of Sessions refers the matter to the Bombay High Court. In his reference, he says that this verdict of non-guilty is perverse. And this is the word he uses, perverse, in the light of evidence that was presented. And he says it's in the interest of juries that it be examined by the High Court. The High Court overturns the jury's verdict. And it says that while there is nothing wrong morally in what Nanavati did, a man cannot be allowed to take the law in his own hands and commit murder. Nanavati spent three years in jail, after which the governor of Maharashtra granted him an executive pardon, setting him free. Jury trial. A trial where a group of people, picked from the general public, gets to decide if a person is guilty or not in a court of law. This is fairly common in America, but not in India. If you go inside Indian courtrooms today, you'll mostly find one judge or a panel of judges deciding on a case. 
but as you would have guessed from Nanavati's case, India also had these modern version of jury trials in the past. And the very first one that we know of was in Madras in 1665. That year, a Portuguese Indian woman named Asentia Dos, the wife of an East India Company employee, was accused of murdering one of her female servants. To resolve this case, the East India Company set up a jury trial consisting of six English and six Portuguese men. Now, the details of the trial are lost, but what we do know, thanks to historians, is that for some reason, Asentia Dos is finally declared not guilty. Soon after this case, jury trials were legally brought into Bombay, Madras and Calcutta. These jury trials, according to historians, were mostly used by English people because they wanted to be judged by their own peers and not the natives. So, the jury in those days would typically consist of 12 men who were all English or European. But there weren't that many English men in Madras or Bombay those days. So, what this meant is that often the jurors were picked from the same pool of folks over and over again, most of whom were employees of the East India Company. It was in the 18th century when legal changes officially allowed Indians also to be tried by a jury of their peers and not just by English men. But even here, the Indian men who did get picked to be jurors were mostly quote-unquote local elite Indians. In Calcutta, for instance, between 1728 and 29, cases that involved local Bengali men were tried by a mixed jury of English people and Bengali merchants. And some historians write that it was the same core group of Bengali merchants who kept serving as jurors for multiple cases. So you see, there was a trend. Jury trials in India, when they happened, looked very English or European with a sprinkling of elite Indians occasionally. It was in the later part of the 19th century that jury trial became a formal part of the Indian law through the Indian Penal Code, and the Code of Criminal Procedure. But even then, the trend of mostly English or European jurors did not really change. Take the case of Bal Gangadhar Tilak, the Indian nationalist and founder of the Marathi newspaper Kesari. In 1897, Tilak was charged with sedition for two Marathi pieces that he had published in Kesari. His jury was made up of six Europeans and three Indians and the six Europeans returned a verdict of guilty, while the three Indians of not guilty. And the judge accepted the majority verdict and sentenced Tilak to 18 months imprisonment. Tilak faced another trial in 1908, again for sedition for things he had published in Kesari. Even this time, there was a jury of seven Europeans and only two Indians. And the verdict was of guilty seven to two. Tilak was sent to jail for six years. The thing is that even after jury trials became a part of the law, they never really gained widespread support in India. While some people believed that it was necessary to be tried by our peers and not let all power rest in the hands of one judge, others felt that lay people, especially Indians, were prone to be biased, that they were easily influenced by religion and caste and could be swayed with bribes and that there weren't enough of the right kind of Indian people available to serve as jurors. In fact, there were several Indian advocates and judges and politicians who wanted to get rid of jury trials, Long years ago, especially after India gained independence. We made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. After the Indian constitution comes into force, the abolition of jury system begins to be discussed in the legal circles and corridors of power. That's Rohan again. Now, in 1953, S.V. Ramaswamy, who is an MP from Madras, he moves a bill in the Lok Sabha seeking to abolish trials by jury. The bill gets widely supported, but there is resistance and chiefly from the government of the day. But the then Home Minister, Kailashnath Kadju, he dismissed the popular idea that the majority of juries were susceptible to corruption and amenable to influence of caste. And he placed the blame of problematic verdicts on the disconnect between the Indian system and the alien system of justice. He goes on so far, if you believe reports in the Hindu, to suggest that all sessions courts 
should only conduct trials by jury however by the time sv ramaswamy's bill is brought before the parliament his appetite kind of waters down in the face of opposition that it faces and so nothing happens and it is left to the states to decide what they wanted and most states wanted jury trials abolished so slowly through the 1950s and 60s one state after another got rid of jury trials in fact it's widely believed that nanavati's case was the last jury trial in india but it was not so there were half a dozen jury trials after nanavati that we can find records of and the last real jury trial in a criminal case happens not in nanavati but in 1973 in calcutta in 1974 when you have the massive overhaul of the code of criminal procedure that the new version removes all references to juries but as i learned jury trials haven't disappeared completely so under the parsi matrimonial and divorce act of 1936 there still exists under sections 19 and 20 for a parsi divorce case to be tried by a jury uh these cases are tried by five member jury these delegates are usually retired influential members of the community who are appointed for a period of 10 years and they are appointed by the chief justices of calcutta bombay and madras and can preside over trials within their territorial jurisdiction so jury trials still exist for parsi divorce cases but in 2016 a woman named naomi irani filed a petition in the supreme court challenging this jury system She said that not only were these Parsi jury trials slow because the jury members met just once or twice a year but she added that the views and opinions of the jury members may not be in sync with the ever evolving societal norms morality and ethics So why was the jury trial still persisting in matters of Parsi divorces she asked All right so far we've established that we had jury trials in India in the past and we still have one form of it operating but time to go back to the main question of our thought experiment which is can we should we ever attempt to get the jury trial back maybe in some different form rohin thinks no now the problem with this is going to be law is a incredibly complex topic and my favorite example to tell people is this provision in the indian evidence act it distinguishes any facts in a trial into three kinds first is facts which are proved the second is facts which are disproved and the third is the facts which are not proved now the issue is disproved and not proved on the prima facie glance seem very simple but when you read their definitions facts that are disproved are facts which we know to be false and facts which are not proved are facts which are neither proved nor disproved Rohan says that it takes a good amount of legal training to be able to distinguish between these tricky nuances of the law. Now to get a jury to decide and get 12 people together to agree on perhaps what would be a reasonable reaction to a certain extension given the highly complex plethora of facts that will come in an ordinary trial it be impossible right? and in that case what would happen is most juries would decide to not convict because there is disagreement and because one would assume that a uh, case has not been proven beyond reasonable doubt understanding nuances of the law is also hard he says because of how our legal documents are written they're not easy to read any trial if you pick up the simplest of trials you have your examination in chief your cross examination of every witness and what have you the final record of the case will run to a few hundred pages at the least full of legal jargon which the jury will then have to apply to the factual situation now my question is are jury is going to be able to understand the processes and be able to engage effectively with the information that is going to be presented to them i don't have answer to that but my answer off the top of my head is no then there's the issue of influence in nanavati's case for example the jury was said to be influenced by what was being said in the media and more specifically this bombay based weekly tabloid called the blitz kept on repeating that he must be released now i don't know how much of it is true but the rumors are that the jury is greatly influenced by the retelling in these newspapers 
and they were also according to some accounts impressed by the arresting image of nanavati who by all accounts was extremely handsome in his naval uniform now you have social media and publications like bar and bench and live law that cover court proceedings in india in almost real time I welcome you back to another episode of courts today on live law they've gone down admirably to every single trial court where major cases are to report on this and people are freely commenting on the proceedings as they play out in court who doesn't today have a social media account and so they are going to be likely be influenced by this one of the basic tenets of the jury system is that every juror who's on the jury will start the case with a completely open mind So in times of social media every crime is given a communal color even if it doesn't exist in some cases every crime is politicized and so a juror cannot come to a trial with a mind that is not biased to be a devil's advocate you could argue that judges aren't objective beings either and there are plenty of cases that so doubt about their political leanings and my answer to that is that judges through years of legal training have to a certain extent let's be very clear right all judges cannot be a political beings in ivory towers judges have to a certain extent found ways to isolate themselves while performing their judicial functions another reason why rohin thinks jury trials will be hard to execute in india is logistics will we find 12 people without prejudice for whom it is practical to leave everything and attend to trials and so simply no and the reason is most of our workforce is in the unorganized sector where they lack social benefits so to expect them to give up work that ensures that they have two square meals a day even if you are to give them money how will you arrive at a sum that is uniform across the country and even then right even if you were to somehow arrive at a sum where is the funding going to come from you are going to need additional funding in addition to the district judge that are already being paid how will you do that where is the money going to come from rohin's final argument is that in the end you are dealing with people's lives story we're tracking from Uttar Pradesh where a muslim man transporting uh, animal carcasses under license was assaulted and abused by a mob of villagers in Uttar Pradesh's Mathura on Sunday night in a disturbing video that has gone viral and in times that we live in where people are lynched simply outside the legal system on the rumors that they've carried beef my answer is that you know you're going to have 12 angry people and they are turning extremely angry highly polarized politically biases and social fractures are now more evident than ever right because if you are going to take what is a truly a representative section of the society that's what it's going to look like and to put one person's life into the hands of a group of people like that i think it's it's a dangerous proposition This episode of Imagined Tomorrow was created by me Shreya Das Gupta. Theme music, sound design, editing and mixing by Abhijit Shailanath. Thanks to Rohin for sharing his thoughts on jury trial with us. Parvati Nair helped with the research and Abhishek Madan listened to multiple drafts. If you would like to support us, please give us a shout out on social media and rate us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. That will help us reach more listeners. Thank you once again for listening. See you soon.